Welcome to ReChurch. I'm Marshall Fant, the Director of Church Consulting and Strategic Planning for Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. My purpose is to encourage pastors and church leaders as you refocus, renew, and revitalize your churches. We've established this podcast to offer practical tips and suggestions as you equip disciples to make disciples. Welcome back to ReChurch. This is Marshall Fant with GFA Mission. So glad to have you uh, tuning in today. Uh, the purpose of ReChurch is to help churches become healthy churches. And we think of church as a church that glorifies God by equipped disciples, continuing to make disciples. So this morning we have uh, three special guests to hopefully equip churches to handle um, different things that come up in life. And the, what the background of this particular, uh, this will be two podcasts. And the background of this was recently in our local church, uh, we had one of our ladies go through a pregnancy loss, and that reminded me of just the impact that it has upon a church and the way we can practice the one another's. And so what I did, I asked three people to participate in this, and uh, the first is Dr. Carol Osha. Carol, welcome. Thank Carol you. is joining us from France this morning, so thank you for your ministry. She. So, Carol, you introduce yourself a little bit, your medical background and your missions background. Okay. Um, Carol Losher, in terms of medically speaking, I'm trained in, as an OBGYN, as a missionary. I was in Africa for around 18 years and now France for three to four. And meanwhile, I go back and forth to Africa to do medical works. Great. And you've been a great blessing to us. Carol's delivered two of our children. So we'll get into that a little bit later. And Rachel Barilla. Rachel, introduce yourself to everybody. Hi. My name is Rachel Barilla, and my husband and I have been in Africa for, I don't know, what is it, about 13, 14 years yeah. now. And that's where I knew Carol before, but we got to know each other really well over there. And um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Great. And I've been with y'all's ministry in Africa. Yes, it's quite yes, a vibrant have. ministry. and. Just love to see your husband ministering there, and yes. y'all have a prison ministry, and, and we do, it, yeah, we do. it's just and phenomenal. We're in the middle of a building project right Amen. now, trying to get uh, some things done. Great, and then my wife Gretchen, yes. you've been with us on podcast before, I so you introduce yourself. I'm Gretchen Fant, and we, I don't know, I've never, I mean, I've been to Africa, but I feel kind of boring because I live here, <laughs> <laughs> but we were in ministry for 21 years at Harvest Baptist Church in Rock Hill, and now we're back in the Greenville area. We've been here under um, GFA. GFA for three almost, and a half, uh, almost, yeah, four almost four years. Almost four years, yeah. Right. And you do a lot of counseling. I do. And um, mm -hmm. you're certified with ACBC. Mm -hmm. And then also you've uh, been through this as well. So the topic is pregnancy loss. And before we get turn it over to Carol to kind of moderate this discussion, uh, two things. Most churches that we're in, we've only been in one church uh, that has equal number of men and women. But I think we often overlook the fact most churches, most churches, a majority of women. And so the purpose of this podcast is to train in those one another's. And I think I appreciate what Carol, uh, Dr. Losher said in the beginning. We want really to bring to bear scripture um, on these situations. And so I want to start with a verse, and then I'm going to turn it over to Carol to moderate it. But Psalm 34, 19 says, many, of the, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So we all do face afflictions and trials, and one of those in, in a lady's life is pregnancy loss. And so this first discussion is going to be with Carol and Rachel. And, and so, Carol, uh, Dr. Losher, I'll turn it over to you to please moderate this. Okay, well, I thought it was interesting that Marsh and Gretchen contacted me about doing a podcast on pregnancy loss. And the next day or the following, I can't remember now, I spoke with a very close friend who had experienced a loss after many years of trying to have a baby. And in talking, she said, you know, I wrote this little poem to help my grief. And I said, well, can I, can I hear your poem? And she shared it. And I said, well, do you mind if I share it with others? And she said, no. So I just felt like this is rather providential. And this is a poem from my friend. She said, today I held my daughter, tears streaming down my face. Too soon for you to be here, you've left an empty place. You have perfectly formed little fingers and tiny but cute little toes. Each precious baby ear is there and sweet little button nose. Your eyes are there, but closed shut now. No chance you'll be able to see. I'll never look, you'll never see the love inside and I'll never see it looking at me. 
I felt that I failed you. I couldn't give you a name. All that I felt was shock and strong grief and some vague false sense of shame. I had only one job to keep you there safe, to give you a warm womb to grow. The question that came, what well, went wrong? I've lost you is all that I know. God, we still don't know why you took her away. Our hearts are now torn in two. Our only hope, our only trust is that you will carry us through. Mm. And to me, that poem is, is really poignant and beautiful. And it shows that this is much more than a medical issue that we're discussing here. I mean, I hear echoes of grief, shame, questioning, um, loss, etc. But personally, I thought what might be easiest is to talk a little bit about the physical aspect of missionaries. I mean, <laughs> of miscarriages <laughs> among missionaries and others. And then just establish that as a springboard and then talk about the more critical emotional, spiritual issues. Great. So the one reason that we invited Rachel here is because I know that she's experienced this a lot personally as well as Gretchen. But I'll just start by giving a very little bit of medical background since this is not the focus of our talk. Okay. And that is simply that this is a very, very common problem. Approximately one in five women who know they are pregnant will suffer a pregnancy loss at some point in time in their pregnancy. It's probably even more for those women who didn't even realize they were pregnant. 80% of the time that occurs quite early, let's say in the first three months. And the good news is that most people who have miscarriage ultimately will carry a baby. Um, but I thought Rachel would be a great person to sort of share her story since I know she's had more than one miscarriage, but she also has three beautiful living children. Amen. So, um, Rachel, do you want to kind of share your story a bit with us now? Well, um, my husband and I had been married for seven years before I was able to get pregnant. And um, we had, we've had a total of five miscarriages at different stages. And the first one, like you had mentioned, I wasn't even positive when that start when the when the miscarriage started happening. I wasn't even sure. I thought, well, maybe I wasn't pregnant, you know. But after going to an office visit with the doctor, you know, he confirmed that it was a, a miscarriage. And um, so, just working through all of those different things, I had, you know, two miscarriages, and then I had uh, my son. So he is a rainbow baby, okay. and that means after. A pregnancy loss you have a successful you know a pregnancy and um, so they call them rainbow baby so I had two miscarriages I had my son Jay and then I had uh, two more miscarriages I had my daughter Belle and then um, five years later I had my, th my second daughter my third child uh, Kay and then uh, three years after that I had my fifth miscarriage so it's just been kind of spot it's not you know, some people were telling me that, oh, once you've had the miscarriage, you'll be done. You can have all successful pregnancies after that. And I did not find that to be true. And mm -hmm. so, um, but the Lord has really been with me yeah. through each one. Um, well, you could tell us so much and so many aspects of how the Lord uses in your life. But just since we're starting this a little bit physically, and I feel like some of our listeners will either anticipate, well, they can anticipate having a problem similar in the future, or maybe they're facing it right now. And so um, there are several options to handle a miscarriage. And I wonder um, what option you chose. And if you were given a choice, if you'd feel comfortable sharing a little bit of that, I know it's sort of medical history, kind of personal. Well, sure. Um, there are the three options. And one is to let nature take its course. The other is a uh, Miscare is I'm sorry is a medication, and the third one would be a DNC, and you can explain what that means, Carol. And uh, <laughs> I know what it is, but <laughs> you can explain it medically better. Well, I thought you did a good job. You said it perfectly. Nature will take its course with time. At least eighty to ninety percent of the time, there is medication to hasten that process and a minor surgical procedure to basically. Rachel used the word DNC. That means dilation and curettage. If you've ever wondered, but it's simply a way to evacuate the uterus surgically. And so, um, 
I've Among done, I've done all three. three. Oh. I've done all three. Okay. And so the first one was let nature take its course. And then two, three, and four was a DNC. And then the fifth one was um, medication. And that one happened when I was in, in Africa. And so they would not do a DNC there. And um, so it's either let nature take its course. And sometimes when it, you, you choose that option, it lasts for a week, maybe two mm. weeks. So I opted for medication just for the predictability, mm. you know. And the one thing I noticed that with, with, um, the, at, with the medication one, so I didn't have the DNC, the hemorrhaging was great. It lasted for like three or four months. And so that was unexpected. I was not expecting that. And so that's something that if you choose that option, you can be prepared mentally. That physically, your body is totally changing, and that might happen. I remember calling Carol saying, what's going on? I, you know, I missed it. This is eight weeks going on. And she's just like, it's fine. It's fine. Just keep going. <laughs> Well, that actually brings up a good point, the uncertainty. And one thing that's difficult in terms of certainty is deciding what option to choose. And um, as a gynecologist, I find it helpful to allow patients to ask me questions, but I ask them questions as well. So if you find yourself in this position, these are some things that you should say to yourself or ask yourself, um, what are you most comfortable with? I find that some women are much more comfortable with the thought of, I need to get used to this mentally. I don't want any intervention. I want things to take its course naturally. And that they're very strong on um, that extreme. Others are like, this pregnancy is over. I don't like the thought that the remnants, if I can use that word, I've heard those words remain. I'd so much rather get this behind me, then I can recover, then I can try to have another one. So you have the two extremes. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's really important is to ask your doctor questions. So you can say, okay, if I choose this, what can I expect? How long does nature take to take, to take its course? If I take this medication, how much time between the pill will the bleeding start, et cetera, et cetera. I just use that as an example. But my point here is don't hesitate to ask your doctor so you can have an idea of what to anticipate. Mm -hmm. And then, Rachel, these, this has got to have been very emotionally difficult for you because five losses. So I thought maybe you can say a little bit about how you felt emotionally or if one – um, technique was a little bit more easy on you, that type of thing. If you just address the emotional aspect of this. Okay, well, with I'm not an openly emotional person, typically. And um, my family has always been that way. And my first one, my first miscarriage, like I said, I wasn't 100% sure I was pregnant. It was that early. It was six weeks when I miscarried. And um, I was unprepared for it, I think that's and, and kind of in shock, like you had said, it was just kind of a shock, like, wait a second, this isn't supposed to be happening. And, um, and you go through the grief, you, you have to allow yourself to grieve because it is a loss. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, you, you lost your watch or, or something like this is a seep, a deep, I wanted this child, you know, and um, so emotionally, I mean, Mark and I had to Mark is my husband, Mark and I had talked about it. And, um, I found myself gravitating towards another woman in our church that had had a miscarriage or two. I think she had had two. And um, I found myself gravitating toward her. And to be honest with you, some people would come up to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm sorry for your loss or, or, you know, God planned this for you or something like that. And they're well-meaning, but sometimes clumsy words. Mm. And mm -hmm. I, I just rejected those people. I mean, like, you've got beautiful, healthy children. You don't have any idea what I'm talking about or what I'm feeling, mm -hmm. you know? And so even as a Christian, <laughs> those, those were wrong reactions. Mm -hmm. It was a sin reaction, but at the same time, it was a genuine feeling of, okay, wait a second, you know, cause I was trying to deal with the loss and trying to deal with other people, not necessarily judging me, you know, but that's almost what it felt like sometimes. So I mm -hmm. found myself clinging to that one person a lot. And so emotionally, I named the child, each child. And since I didn't, we didn't do a testing of ma male or female, I just picked a name, a guy's name, girl, a male, female, both names, you know, each time. 
And so that kind of helped me think of it. And even with my my last pregnancy uh, or last miscarriage, my son came up to me and he says, I'm sorry, Mom. And I said, what are you sorry for? And he said, I know that you would be preparing for baby Jack to be born mm-hmm. right about now mm-hmm. if, if he hadn't died. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so even my kids acknowledged the name, especially mm-hmm. Jack, because that was the one we, I had chosen for the last one, and they were alive at that point, you know. And so, um, but all three of them talk about it once in a while. Yeah. Well, I think that's really good. Some of those points that you brought up, and almost as if to validate what you're saying, even in the medical literature, I find it interesting that um, in my literature, from a gynecologist or obstetrician point of view. I got this quote that said one fourth to one third of women with pregnancy loss experience some quote adverse mental health outcomes following that loss end quote. So you see, this is very genuine and you use the word loss and you said it wasn't like a loss wash. So I think that that's what we'd like to focus on, particularly for the rest of our time, how to handle that loss, especially as Christians But before we get even to that, you mentioned you reached out to someone because she had a loss. Yes. And I'm curious if the Lord has let you use your own loss to reach out to other women. Do you have an example of that? Well, I have. And it's interesting because you never expect to use that necessarily in ministry because Mm -hmm. it's such a personal thing. And you don't want to, you have to open yourself up to this. And, um, and so like, in Cameroon, you know, we had this this woman, and she was married to a Christian. She herself was a Christian, a pastor, and he, when she experienced two miscarriages, that's very, very taboo subject over there. And you must have done something to harm your child. You didn't want this child. There's got to be sin in your life. And she was shamed. She was mm-hmm. outcast from her family because she had experienced this. And so... I was at a reception, and she was at the same reception. She was working, and I was just uh, one of the, the many that were there attending. And after this, after it was done, after the reception was over, we were kind of being herded out of the room because they needed the room for another group coming in. And Yvette was sitting there, kind of sitting close to the floor on this little tiny bench, and I just leaned over to her, and I said, Yvette, I've had miscarriages too. And that's literally all I said. Mm. I said wow. nothing else. And I walked out because, like I said, we were being kind of pushed out. And she said to another missionary lady later, that was the most encouraging thing that anybody has ever done wow. for her. Wow. You know, wow. because I, as a, white, as a white person, first of all, I'm having a miscarriage. Secondly, I don't have sin in my life. I did not not want the baby. And all these other things that she was accused of, she's like, well, sure, certainly that can't be in the missionary's wife. You know, and um, so it was it's been it's been useful for reaching out to women who have had um, any kind of pregnancy loss, stillbirth or right after the baby's born, uh, the baby dies, you know, different things like that. It's been it's been easier for me to reach out. I mean, Carol was we were at a hospital together in Africa and Carol sent me over to talk with these people. I mean, it's not that she wouldn't be willing to do that, but I can relate so much more. Yeah. And they op- and these ladies opened up. Wow. Wow. I think it's beautiful how the Lord turns our ashes into beauty and uses them for his purposes. And you just used the word um, miscarriage and stillbirth in the last little mm-hmm. minute or two. And so maybe I will distinguish that just from a medical point of view. We tend to use the word miscarriage early in a pregnancy and stillbirth later in a pregnancy. And stillbirth is more when a baby is born and you can identify its little features like that poem I read at the beginning. It's something that you can hold in your hand. And sometimes that's another part of miscarriage that's difficult is that it's a little bit harder to work through something than you can't really picture it, but you know that you've lost not only a present, but a future. Mm-hmm. And I have Gretchen is with us today, and she's had both miscarriages and stillbirths. And in addition to that, um, as she mentioned herself, Gretchen does a lot of counseling, so I know that she's encountered people with this type of loss. And so um, maybe I thought Gretchen could share with us a little bit about some of the reactions that she's seen in women who've had miscarriages. 
Yes, um, Rachel has brought up so many good points. <clears throat> I would like to say that I would like to say that uh, women who have not experienced miscar- miscarriages, I would I would never say that you can't help someone, and I also would not say not to say anything because honestly, when you're in that position, and I could just feel it, um, I'm not real demonstrative in my emotions either, but I cry every time I think about it. And, and for me, it's been 28 years, um, I think, or something like that around in that time. But um, uh, when, when you first, when it first happens, I don't think anything anybody says, unless it is someone who has experienced it and is very uh, compassionate and you connect with them, I don't think anything anybody says is you're really satisfied with Mm -hmm. so that Mm -hmm. a person if you go back to church and nobody says anything it kind of irritates you and if everybody (laughs) says something it irritates you (laughs) and uh you know and i've had people say that well nobody said anything and then everybody says something and then they say oh i can't come to church because everybody's saying stuff you know so (laughs) you can't that that cannot but that that shouldn't keep the person who has not experienced a miscarriage to say something, I wouldn't say a lot, and I would never try to, to especially at first, um, you know, address any issues in the girl or woman's life or something like that, but to say, I am so sorry, I know this. I, I remember uh, when I lost um, the when, what, what you would consider right on the, on the line there of being a stillbirth. Um, we named him David, but I, I remember, here I am again, start to cry. Um, but um, I remember getting a card from a neighbor, and it simply said, my heart is breaking for you. <laughs> and I, I remember reading that and thinking, that's exactly how I feel. I feel right. like my heart is breaking. Now, that really ministered to me. But, you know, the next person might say, yeah, what do you know? You know, <laughs> you've never experienced it. So you you just don't know. You just try to love people. and And I think it really just... Um, even knowing these things is so important for the church, even knowing mm-hmm. how it feels, because uh, women need to speak truth into women's lives. Women need to minister to the souls of other women. Men get very uncomfortable when women start crying. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> and um, and men are in a perfect position for the woman to say, well, what do you know? Uh, because they don't know. Uh, but they do, in a sense, they, they can address the men. And I, I don't think we need to also uh, forget that the men have have ha- had a great loss as well. And sometimes it's easy to be, oh, the woman, you know, to focus on her and then forget about the men in the church. So I, I think um, my, my reaction it to... When uh, I've actually had two, I had a miscarriage at eight weeks, which really did not affect me. It was just kind of a natural. It happened. It didn't. It didn't. I hadn't told anybody. But but this second one, my first reaction, and Carol, you remember this because Carol delivered this one was. Yeah, I, I can remember the room we were in. Everything, yes, the baby. Yes, and I remember my first reaction was, "Don't touch me." <laughs> <laughs> I I just needed to to to. Think about it. it. I, I had to process it, and I didn't want anybody to do anything. I wanted them, to, everyone, to leave me alone. And I went home, and after about twenty-four hours, I thought, if this, I saw that baby on the ultrasound, and um, I knew that baby was not living, and I knew that baby was inside of me, and I couldn't stand it. So I think the whole idea of being very flexible and allowing the the woman to make a choice and even to change that choice, which you, you were so gracious. After 24 hours, I said, I've got to come in. I'm, I, you know, I, can't, I couldn't stand the thought of it. I had totally changed. So it, there's so many unknowns. Uh, I think that I don't think even a woman personally knows how she's going to re- respond until it happens. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. it totally will shock you sometimes, the, th- the ways that you, you respond. I hope that's what you, was that what you were looking for in terms of responses. Oh, precisely, and um, I like the fact that you also mentioned that the husband, father of the baby, is grieving too. And what I've experienced sometime in talking to couples is that women and men grieve very very differently. 
And um, so at times that can create a conflict. And what my experience has been is that I think that sometimes the women, woman doesn't feel that her husband can truly enter into her pain and her pain team tends to linger a little bit longer. Ultimately, this different way of um, absorbing and working through a loss to me can lead to some hardship in marriage. And so I wonder too, since you've dealt a lot with marital conflict resolution, if you could mention that, Gretchen. Yes, I think that women, particularly now, there's a lot of talk about my soulmate, and women uh, put a lot of pressure on men to uh, really feel what they're feeling. And they are most, now there are exceptions, but most men just do not. And they are different. In fact, my husband and I were just working on a project yesterday measuring stuff, and I, we totally, we think totally differently about how, how, how to fit this and this and what to do next. And, and I, that is okay. And I, I think that uh, a woman cannot expect a, a man to grieve and to think exactly like she is, thinking and grieving. And that doesn't mean he doesn't care. That mm-hmm. means um, he's just different. He thinks, and it's a good thing, you know, it would be a mess probably if, if the husband and wife were, did, thought exactly the same way. You know, you don't want that. So that's why women help women. It's not that your husband can't help you, but I think the woman needs to be sensitive to the fact that he is grieving too, mm-hmm. and he may be expressing it differently, but that's okay, and not to become angry about it um, because he's not like me. Uh, so... Uh, you know, there, there are differences, and, and I don't know, Rachel may, may differ on this because maybe her husband is her soulmate and can <laughs> totally, but most of the time, you know, most of the time a woman does need another woman who has some experience and, or, or not, just is compassionate and can listen and talk and, and really relate to her in these matters. All right, can I interject here? Mm-hmm. So as we kind of wrap up, this first podcast, I know Rachel's got some scriptures that helped her get through this. So, Rachel, could you take a few minutes? And then, Carol, you think of further thoughts um, for the for our first podcast here on miscarriage, and we'll deal with stillbirth in greater detail in the next one with Gretchen. And But can you bring in some scripture to help everyone that ministered to you? Yes. Um, I, I like this passage in Isaiah 55, and it's, it has gone through my mind many times in, in different situations. And, um, you know, as, as far for the, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And that's in Isaiah 55, 9. And it was one of those things that um, you just never, you think what I want to do is good and what I want to feel is right because I'm just a human, you know, and I have to, come back to the the idea of that you know god has has something for me here he's he's not left me out in the cold and it brings you to to in jeremiah where it talks about my my plans i have plans for you Mm -hmm. to give you hope and a future and sometimes all you can do is when you get to that point that you are at your lowest sometimes you know especially with multiple losses and you just like, okay, Lord Jesus, I'm just going to hold your hand, and you're mm-hmm. going to walk me through this because I've got nothing. Mm-hmm. I cannot do this on my own. And that's what a lot of women feel like. Nobody understands this. Nobody, nobody knows what I'm feeling. Nobody knows what I'm th- why, which is why you reach out to people that right. have experiences. And we do podcasts like this to equip people. Exactly. To reach out. Right. All right. So my last question is: We wrap up this first one. Carol, I'll go to you first. Carol, what would you tell a pastor? Uh, a pastoral staff, a pastor's wife that may not have been through this, what would you tell from your experience, what, what, what single advice or a couple of things would you tell pastoral staff how they best can minister to a family that has just gone through a miscarriage? Well, I think you just said just gone through a miscarriage, and I think at the beginning that both the husband and the wife should be dealt with very gently with a lot of understanding and a lot of patience, almost like when Job at first spoke out 
just poured out his heart and he said, you shouldn't measure my words right now. I, I think that you just have to be not very non-judgmental, very supportive, very delicate, uh, particularly at first. Yet on the other extreme from a pastoral staff or from a counseling situation, because this is such an emotionally charged situation, it involves grief, but it also even involves hormones trying to get back um, to their non-pregnant state, etc. Sometimes the process lingers and becomes almost, I want to use the word pathological, and that's where I think a good counselor could come in if this process, instead of resolving with just sadness and a gift right. to help someone else and still trust in the Lord, if it's turned a little sour and gone into despair and right. fear, anger, resentment, and that's where maybe someone like you and Gretchen could be a real help to someone provided enough time has gone by. Yeah, or any pastor's wife. All right, so, Rachel, my question for you is this. All right, Second Corinthians tells us that with the comfort that we've been given, mm-hmm. we are to comfort others. Right. Okay, so what would your advice be to pastor, pastor wife, pastoral staff? How in the world do we exercise that in this situation? Okay, um, I was a pastor's wife before we became a missionary. Mm. And so I, I see it from both sides. Missionaries... A lot of times you're so far away from anybody mm-hmm. that the, the church, if the church, not necessarily the pastor per se, but the church reaches out and says, what can we do to help? And a lot of times it's nothing, you know, just prayer. Just, I mean, especially when you're in such a far distance. Mm-hmm. If the church has a woman's ministry, a women's ministry, right. um, like um not necessarily like ladies missionary fellowship, but some right. sort of women's sure. ministry, mm-hmm. you know, offer to you know, call her. I mean, I, Mm -hmm. I didn't mind people calling me when I was, when I was bedridden, I didn't mind people calling me and just Mm -hmm. talking about normal everyday things because I had to get back to life. Right. I couldn't just wallow in my grief. And so we're talking about school, we're talking about Mm -hmm. work. And and it's not that I, she couldn't say anything about the pregnancy loss. It was just the fact that, okay, I, in my mind, I've got a transition and I've got right. to look forward. So would you say it would be good for a pastor to have a go-to couple, it, a go-to lady? It would. Yeah, I think this, it would. Yeah. Or, or if there's... So the pastor should be equipping others, the Titus two model women, mm-hmm. model helping women. Right. So that was kind of my challenge. Okay, <laughs> pastors, wake up. Okay, you know, you, there, there are ladies in your church that can do this ministry. It's not all on your hands. Right. And, okay. and like she said, with like Gretchen said, with the yeah. men, the men yeah. need to grieve too. And a lot of time, my husband stepped up and he just, mm-hmm. you know, he had help with cleaning and, you know, mm-hmm. other, just, he's working 40 hours yeah. a week, but he stepped up to help, sure. especially after the, after my son was born, you know, cause then I've got a child to take care of, but just praying with Mark would mean a lot to him, okay. you know, and praying for him, especially because he's not very open emotional either and right. he's not going to cry in front of the other men as of course but it's nice to acknowledge the fact that listen we're here for you but praying one to another i yes. mean just bearing one another's burdens yes. okay galatians 6 so there are a lot of one another passages mm-hmm. carol anything in closing on this on this we're going into our next one in just a second so for sake of our listeners just just uh, this will be our podcast first one on this and then we'll be rolling into a second one Carol, any closing words from uh, your side of things? I think just the frequency of this condition it lends itself to um, really the necessity of being prepared to help yeah. women and understanding a little bit, hopefully, after we've talked about how many emotional and spiritual repercussions can arise from something that is so physically common, just to be prepared. And it's a great topic, I think, to discuss here on our podcast. Great. So, Carol, thank you. Rachel, thank you. Gretchen, thank you. We look forward to our next podcast together. We also want to thank GFA Missions. Uh, if you got any questions on GFA, you can go to gfamissions.org. Uh, on the foreign mission side, uh, as you've heard Rachel talk about and Carol, both of them serve, they and their husbands serve together on that side. On the American side, you can contact uh, me or Gretchen through gfamissions.org. Thank you all for just participating. Look forward to our next podcast. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. You're listening to ReChurch, a podcast of Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. 
If you would like more information about our ministry or how we may assist you and your church, visit us at gfamissions.org slash consulting.